Hello, everyone. My name is Sven de Geyser. I am a radiologist in Ghent University Hospital, and this is a presentation on posterior circulation stroke, more specifically imaging of posterior circulation stroke. There are various presentations on this channel on ischemic stroke, but as you have noticed or not noticed, they are mainly dealing with anterior circulation stroke. A lot of attention is given to anterior circulation strokes because, especially since it has been proven in 2015 in the big five studies that uh, endovascular thrombectomy for large vessels occlusions and the anterior circulation is a safe and effective procedure, something that has not been proven for posterior circulation strokes. And as a consequence, they tend to be a bit neglected and they definitely need to be discussed separately because most of the things you'll find on, for instance, the role of perfusion CT in ischemic stroke is focused on anterior circulation stroke, not on posterior circulation stroke. So that's why I decided to make a separate presentation on posterior circulation stroke, because it's nevertheless a very important topic. Posterior circulation strokes are, are associated with a high morbidity and mortality, so they definitely deserve our attention. And in this presentation, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to start with a short introduction, then I'm going to talk about the vascular anatomy and uh, several varieties you can encounter in vascular anatomy before focusing on the main topic of this presentation, the imaging findings on CT and MRI. <coughs> My apologies. Let's start with a short introduction. Posterior circulation strokes are not that frequent. They are less frequent than anterior circulation strokes, but still constitute about 20% of ischemic stroke. And the clinical presentation of a posterior circulation stroke is a lot more variable compared to anterior circulation strokes. And anterior circulation strokes, patients will present uh, with uh, very acutely developed focal neurological deficits. And clinically, there will already immediately be a suspicion of an acute ischemic stroke or a hemorrhage, that something is going on. That can be lacking in posterior circulation strokes because patients can present with non-focal symptoms, which can dominate the clinical presentation, like vertigo or nausea, for instance. When it's a lacunar stroke, patients can present with isolated cranial nerve palsies, like uh, isolated oculomotor deficits. Patients can have motor symptoms uh, when the brainstem is involved, and and these can range from a hemiparesis to a quadriparesis to a full-blown locked-in syndrome. And patients can have a clinical presentation that is dominated by somnolence, coma, uh, encephalopathy, which is also very difficult to evaluate. Uh, well, it makes the patient difficult to evaluate clinically on other neurological deficits. So a very variable clinical presentation, often with non-focal symptoms, and the, ray, and the consequence is that this can lead to a delay in diagnosis because there is not an immediately an immediate suspicion of an acute ischemic stroke and consequently also a delay and treatment. Uh, this is a slide I made. Uh, it's one of the first slides I made when I started going online with my stuff, with my presentations and uh, the drawings I made for these presentations. Uh, and this is a slide illustrating the variability of clinical symptoms you can encounter in posterior fossa strokes or posterior circulation strokes, depending on the structure involved. When it's mainly a cerebellar stroke, patients can present with symptoms like vertigo, ataxia, nystagmus, dysarchia. When the thalamus or the midbrain are involved, patients can present with a clinical picture dominated by a lethargy or somnolence, coma, or they can have oculomotor palsies when the oculomotor nerve is involved. Uh, infarctions in the brain stem can be associated with uh, cranial nerve palsies like an abducens palsy. Here is the sixth and here is the trochlear nerve, the trochlear nerve and the abducens nerve, the nucleus is located there. And these are connected by pathways and isolated infarctions in these pathways can lead to an intranuclear ophthalmoplegia. Patients can have a facial nerve palsy or hemifacial sensory loss, depending on where the stroke is located. And of course, the corticospinal tracts also course through the anterior pons, so patients can also have a hemiparesis or a quadriparesis. And when you have strokes and medulla oblongata, patients can have swallowing difficulties due to involvement of the glossopharyngeal uh, vehicle or accessory nerves. They can have 
difficulties with blood pressure, heart rate, respiration, or nausea and vomiting when the area postrema, uh, the vomiting center of the brain, is involved. And once again, these are non-focal and very non-specific symptoms. And studies have shown, oh, and lastly, with infarctions involving the occipital lobes, patients will present with hemianopia or a quadrantanopia. So studies have shown that the majority of patients with posterior circulation strokes actually present with non-specific symptoms like vertigo, nausea, somnolence, encephalopathy, and so on. And less than 5% will have specific symptoms like a Horner syndrome, cross-sensory deficits, quadrantanopia, and motor deficits. So once again, emphasizing that diagnosis can be difficult and clinical suspicion can be low. And this emphasizes the role of imaging in these strokes. But before jumping to imaging, I'm going to talk a little bit about the va vascular anatomy and the vascular variations you can encounter in the posterior circulation. Let's start with vascular anatomy. Uh, the posterior circulation is supplied by the uh, vertebral vertebral arteries and the basilar artery. And this is a very nice illustration I borrowed from Radiopedia. And thank you very much to Frank Gayart and his colleagues for making these available to us. So credit where credit is due. Nice illustration from Radiopedia, the best radiology site out there, if you believe me, uh, if you ask me. And the vertebral uh, artery can be divided in four segments. We have the V1 segment, the preforaminal segment, which is the part of the vertebral artery between its origin Generally, that's the subclavian artery on both sides before it enters the vertebral foramen of the transverse process of generally some variability as possible, but generally the sixth cervical vertebra. Then we have the V2 segment or the foraminal segment, which is basically the segment of the vertebral artery coursing through the vertebral uh, foramina of the uh, sixth to the third cervical vertebra. Then we have the V3 segment, which is the segment coursing to the vertebral foramen of the uh, second and the first cervical vertebra, and also the part running on top of the first vertebral artery, uh, vertebra before it pierces the dura. And lastly, we have the V4 segment, the intradural segment. We cannot see exactly when the vertebral artery or where the vertebral artery pierces the dura, but we kind of assume it. it's the intracranial part of the vertebral artery, the terminal segment. And there's a very important artery arising from the V4, uh, V4 segment of the vertebral artery, and that is the posterior inferior cerebellar artery, which supplies the posterior inferior surface of the cerebellum. Now illustrating basilar artery anatomy. So the posterior circulation can be divided into territories. We have the inferior uh, territory or the proximal territory, which is uh, basically supplied by uh, the V4 segment of the vertebral artery and the posterior inferior cerebellar artery. It's basically the inferior posterior surface of the cerebellum. Then we have the middle territory, which is mainly supplied by branches of the basilar artery, especially the anterior inferior cerebellar artery. So this one. So uh, this artery supplies the anterior inferior part of the cerebellar surface. And then we have the distal territory, uh, which consists of the superior surface of the cerebellum, the thalamus and the midbrain and the occipital lobes. And important branches here are the superior cerebellar artery, which supplies the superior surface of the cerebellum. And we also have the posterior cerebral artery supplying the occipital lobe. Then we have some perforating branches. We have the so-called rami at pontem in Latin. So these are basically small perforating branches supplying the brain stem, so uh, the pons to be more specific. And we have the very small thalamoperforating branches arising from the P1 segment 
of the posterior cerebral arteries, uh, which supply the medial part of the thalamus and the central part of the midbrain. We have other perforating branches supplying the rest of the thalamus, but this presentation is not on the vascular anatomy of the thalamus that would lead us too far. So this suffices for a good understanding of the vascular anatomy of the posterior circulation. Now let's talk about vascular variations you can encounter. This is probably the most frequent one, but it can be an important one. What do we see here? Uh, these are 3D uh, reconstructions I made. We see here the, uh, this is going to be, I have some difficulties orientating myself. This is the brachiocephalic trunk, and this is the right subclavian, uh, the right vertebral artery arising from the right subclavian artery. And I cut out the right uh, carotid over here. And here you see the left vertebral artery, and normally the left vertebral artery arises from the left subclavian artery, except in this case it doesn't. It arises directly from the um, aorta, uh, the aorta rather. Uh, this is another illustration more clearly showing you how the vertebral artery arises directly from the aorta and a direct origin of the left vertebral artery is not uh, uncommon so it is seen in about five percent of the general population and why can it be important well uh, that takes me back to my days as a neuroradiology resident who uh, had to assist uh, in uh, interventional procedures. And I once assisted my department head, Professor Wiesmann, when I was still working in Germany in Aachen, who had to do a diagnostic examination in a patient with, I believe, uh, basilar artery aneurysm, and who tried to find the left vertebral artery, who was uh, constantly injecting the left subclavian artery, but couldn't really find it. I had already seen that the patient had a direct origin or a straight origin from the aortic arch, uh, the left vertebral artery, uh, but I was too shy to tell him. So after about 10 minutes of trying, I finally told my department head, well, the head professor, uh, maybe you haven't seen it, but on the CT angiography, the left vertebral artery originates directly from the aortic arch, and that's why you can't find it if you only inject an electroplasm artery. And then he was a little bit annoyed that I didn't tell him 10 minutes earlier. Luckily, it wasn't a stroke, so time wasn't brain in that particular situation. What you can also frequently see is a symmetry in the size of the vertebral arteries. Take this patient, for instance, the right vertebral artery, nicely depicted over here, is a lot smaller than the left vertebral artery. And vertebral artery is seen in about 70% of the general population. And in most cases, you will see a dominant left vertebral artery. So the left vertebral artery will be a little bigger uh, will be a lot bigger and wider than the right vertebral artery. Uh, this is another uh, 3D reconstruction. We see here a dominant left vertebral artery, and here we have the right vertebral artery, which seems to terminate on these 3D reconstructions. I'm not sure if the V4 segment is completely absent or just incredibly hypoplastic. So let's also look at our uh, other um, at our other reconstructions. Uh, over here we see that the V4 segment is completely absent. So this is an aplasia of the V4 segment of the right vertebral artery, also not infrequent, and there is a so-called functional termination in the posterior inferior cerebral artery. When do we talk about vertebral artery hypoplasia? When the V4 segment is extremely thin, less than two millimeter in size, but mostly we don't measure it, we just judge it, judge it visually, and it is not infrequent, observed in about 2% to even 26% of the general population. I think this variability merely depends on how strict 
you are and defining it because there are some criteria size based but in daily clinical practice we rarely measure uh, the size of the fever segment of the vertebral artery we just see that it is absent or extremely thin so this is another uh, frequent variation you can see and this is quite an important one be why because in my experience the first time a radiology resident is confronted with it it is often confused for pathology what do we see over here these are uh, 3d tough angiography reconstructions of the basilar artery and something seems a bit strange over here let's magnify this a little bit it seems as if there is a little hole in the middle of the proximal basilar artery. This is a so-called basilar artery fenestration. It is a very focal duplication um, of part of the artery, and it's usually seen in the proximal part, so the lower end. It's seen in about, let's say, 0.5% to make it easy of the general population. Uh, sometimes I think this is maybe a bit underestimated because I do not see it that infrequently. And the most important thing is that you know that this is just an anatomic variation and you should not mistake it for vertebral artery dissection. Uh, these are the 3D tough angiography images in the same patient and here we see the focal duplication or the focal fenestration of the basilar artery and once you know it exists you can see it often here we can even see it on 3d mprh images with gadolinium it's very subtle but you see there appears to be a small hole in the proximal part of the basilar artery and here we see it on a classical angiography in a patient who has a coiled top of the basilar artery aneurysm. So basal artery fenestration, once you know it, you see it everywhere and just do not mistake it for pathology. What is going on here? Once again, we are looking at 3D tough angiography uh, reconstructions um, in a patient who has a very thin basilar artery. Is this normal or abnormal? Does this patient have severe atraumatosis of the basilar artery? And is this a very long stenosis of the basilar artery? No, the patient has a hypoplasia of the basilar artery. And if you see hypoplasia of the basilar artery, you should ask yourself why. It is because a large part of the posterior circulation will not be supplied by the vertebral arteries and the basilar artery, but by the anterior circulation, by the anterior carotids. So why? In most cases it will be because the occipital lobes are supplied by the internal carotids because there is a persistent fetal origin from the posterior cerebral arteries which can be unilateral or bilateral. So this is the so-called bilateral fetal PCA origin in which the posterior cerebral arteries originate directly from the internal carotid arteries and as a consequence the vert the vertebral basilar system basically needs to supply less blood to the posterior circulation and appears smaller. Uh, fetal origin can be complete or incomplete. When it is complete, there is a complete absence of the P1 segment of the posterior cerebral artery, so the segment that arises from the basilar artery. In this patient, it is incomplete because we see a very thin hypoplastic P1 segment. Here we have the uh, basically this is the uh, communicating. Uh, well, how do you say it in English? And that we say the uh, ramus communicans posterior, uh, supplying directly the P2 and other segments of the posterior cerebral artery. And here we have a very thin hypoplastic P1 segment arising from the head of the basilar artery. So this is an incomplete fetal origin of the posterior cerebral artery. Uh, this is another variation you can encounter. Uh, we see a hypoplastic P1 segment bilaterally uh, arising from the basilar head. We see a fetal origin, but it's an, it's an incomplete fetal origin of the posterior cerebral arteries. And we also see that the patient has two superior cerebral arteries. This is a double superior cerebral artery which is observed in about 3 to 10 percent of the general population.
Now, this is also a patient with hypoplasia of the basilar artery. We see that the patient has a persistent fetal origin of the posterior cerebral artery on both sides, but there we have this artery. This is not the posterior cerebral artery. This is not the communicating uh, branch. Oh, I really don't know how to say it in English. So the ramus communicans posterior, uh, connecting the internal carotid uh, with the uh, posterior cerebral artery. That's not that artery. So what artery is that? Well, that's basically a persistent embryological anastomosis between the internal carotids and the basilar artery, because embryologically, the basilar artery is formed before the vertebral arteries and is originally and the embryo connected to the internal carotids. And you have several anastomoses uh, in that embryological time frame, and some of these can sometimes persist uh, until adulthood. And this is an example, and it's probably the most frequent one. I'm not going to show you each and every subtype. Uh, this is the most frequent one. This is the so-called persistent trigeminal artery, which connects um, the internal carotid artery with the basilar artery or can sometimes connect directly with one of the cerebellar arteries. So it doesn't really have to connect to the basilar artery. Uh, generally, the basilar artery can also be hypoplastic in a case like this. Um, and it's just one of those variations you have to know that exists. So over here on the sagittal slices, here we see the posterior cerebral artery. And then underneath it, we see this connection between the internal carotid artery and the hypoplastic basilar artery. So very nice uh, illustrations, I believe. And here are some drawings to help you out or some uh, uh, arrows to help you out. Then there is a lot of variability in the size of the posterior and the anterior inferior cerebral arteries. Uh, they can be bilateral symmetric, they can be bilaterally asymmetric, they can be unilateral. Um, so you can have a unilateral posterior inferior cerebellar artery basically supplying both sizes of the posterior, uh, both halves of the posterior inferior cerebellar surface. So there's a lot of variability there. And it's very important not to mistake this variability for pathology. And it's also known that there's a reciprocal relationship in size of the ICA and the PICA. In some cases, the PICA will be hypertrophic and then the ICA will be smaller, will appear hypertrophic. And in other cases, the ICAs will be dominant, they will appear hypertrophic and the PICA will be smaller or hypertrophic. So here are some arrows showing you uh, asymmetrical anterior inferior cerebellar arteries with the right one being a lot bigger than the left one. And we see that there is also absence of the posterior inferior cerebellar artery in this patient. And the anterior inferior cerebellar artery reaches as very long, so probably also supplies the posterior inferior cerebellar surface in this patient. So what is the conclusion here? We have two anterior and inferior cerebellar arteries with the right one being dominant, and we have no posterior and inferior cerebellar arteries. So we have basically a dominant right ICA, which will supply most of the inferior surface of the cerebellar hemispheres. So just keep in mind, I'm just showing you one example. There is a lot of variability when it comes to the supply of the posterior and the uh, inferior surface of the cerebellar hemispheres. Now let's talk about imaging of posterior circulation strokes. And in imaging, we have two modalities. We have CT and MRI. CT is a modality which is uh, most frequently performed in the acute phase and MRI often in the second phase with uh, its main role to assess for final damage or look for very small lacunar infarctions that are not easily picked up on CT. Let's start with CT. Uh, when a patient is suspected of having an ischemic stroke, we generally do an enhanced CT, CT angiography, and CT perfusion. Difficulty in posterior circulation stroke is that that suspicion is sometimes lacking. So imaging really, really is important. This is a patient with a posterior circulation stroke and on an enhanced CT, everything seemed normal. But if you look very carefully and if you compare the density of the basilar artery 
and this will be the middle or the distal basilar artery and this is the proximal basilar artery we see that this is very dense this is a dense artery sign and a dense artery sign we know from our uh, anterior circulation strokes it's suggestive of a thrombus um, in, the, uh, in an artery so this patient definitely should get a CT angiography is this a useful sign, the dense basilar artery? Well, if it's very clear, it has a very high specificity, but it has a very low sensitivity. So unenhanced CT alone will not suffice for the diagnosis of a posterior circulation stroke. Uh, what's even more, only in about 35% of posterior circulation stroke will signs of infarction um, be present. So most uh, unenhanced CTs of the brain will be negative. And I'm not just talking about a dense basilar artery, which is a large vessel occlusion. I'm talking about signs of infarction in general now. So an enhanced CT will be completely negative in the majority of cases. And if you combine that with the fact that the clinical presentation is often non-specific, the diagnostic value of only performing an enhanced CT in these patients is actually quite low. Um, this is just an illustration. We all know the aspect score which is used in anterior circulation strokes. Some authors have developed a posterior circulation aspect. It is not widely used to the best of my knowledge. We don't use it at our center, but I think it is a useful illustration of the several anatomical regions you have to inspect, you have to inspect on signs of early infarction in a patient suspected of having a posterior circulation stroke. And what are those? Uh, that would be the occipital lobes and the thalamus uh, when you have an occlusion of the posterior cerebral artery. That would be the midbrain, uh, which is supplied by thalamoperforating branches. And that would be the pons, which is supplied by the basilar artery and the rami at pontem, so the perforating branches of the basilar artery. And lastly, we have the cerebellum, supplied by either the superior cerebellar artery, inferior, uh, posterior inferior cerebellar artery, or anterior inferior cerebellar artery. So it's just a nice illustration of the anatomical regions. To me, you sh uh, certainly have to scrutinize for signs of early infarction but keep in mind that these can be subtle, they can be easily overlooked, and the patient can have an ischemic infarction but still have no signs of infarction on your unenhanced CT yet. So unenhanced CT has a low diagnostic value. Uh, keep, definitely keep it in mind. So is it useful to add a perfusion CT? Yes. That is my experience has also been proven in studies. I do not know, I do not know the numbers by head, but I, if I'm not mistaken, the diagnostic value for the detection of a posterior circulation stroke is about 35% for an enhanced CT alone. If you add a perfusion CT that increases to about oh, it's a little bit less than 80%, I believe. And that's a lot. That's a huge difference. Take this patient, for instance. Uh, this patient presented with uh, nausea and vertigo, so uh, very unspecific symptoms. On unenhanced CT of the brain, we see nothing out of the ordinary, but on the Tmax and the time to drain map of a perfusion study, we see that there's an area of hypoperfusion involving the medial, no, the lateral inferior part of the cerebellum. And this was described as a possible stroke. Uh, I admit that sometimes it's difficult to interpret that region due to a lot of skull base artifacts, but it's, this seemed very vascular. And on follow up imaging, this proved uh, to be an infarction. So, uh, this was not a large vessel stroke, so the basilar artery was open, and isolated infarctions due to an occlusion of the anterior or the posterior inferior cerebellar artery are often difficult to detect on CT angiography, also because there is a huge anatomic variability. So in this patient, an enhanced CT of the brain was negative. The CTA was also negative. When we looked back, there was suspicion that maybe there was an occlusion of the anterior and inferior cerebral artery on that side, but we weren't really sure. But the PCT, the perfusion CT, was abnormal, and the final diagnosis was 
and unfortunately the territory of the right anterior inferior cerebellar artery. This is a perfusion study in a patient who had a basilar artery thrombosis, so the entire basilar artery was occluded, and we see perfusion deficits involving the territory of the uh, uh, the entire territory of the posterior circulation. So we have perfusion, hyperperfusion, and the thalamus on both sides and the occipital lobes, but also this is better seen on uh, the time to drain map over here, the brainstem and the cerebellar hemispheres, and even somewhat in the medial part of the temporal lobes. Now, that's all fine and dandy. Uh, normally, we won't miss an occlusion of the entire basilar artery on a CT angiography. And the real question is, should this patient receive a thrombectomy and do these findings, do what does what we see on perfusion CT play a role in treatment selection? Well, the answer is very easy, no. Perfusion CT definitely has a role in increasing your diagnostic accuracy, but it doesn't really play a role in the treatment selection or the decision to treat yes or no. To be even uh, more frank, there is very little evidence that thrombectomy and a large vessel occlusion and the posterior circulation is uh, an effective procedure or a beneficial procedure, uh, but in a lot of centers, they will do it nevertheless because these occlusions have such a bad morbidity and mortality rate that doing nothing, well, you, by doing nothing, well, the patient has a very high risk of dying or having severe neurological deficits, so you can only give your patient a chance by doing the procedure. But the evidence is quite low. And, um, this is uh, so the role of uh, perfusion CT, and this is what also has been proven in several studies, is to increase the detection of your posterior fossa stroke or to improve your diagnostic accuracy. And once again, illustrating this case, you won't miss an entire basilar artery occlusion, but when it is a smaller stroke involving uh, just one of the branches uh, of the basilar artery or a smaller territory, you can miss it on your CT angiography uh, or on your unenhanced CT. And by doing perfusion CT, you will increase diagnostic accuracy. Now, coming back to the question on does perfusion CT play a role in uh, your, deci your decision to treat or not? Well, no, it doesn't. Uh, several reasons. You, you will try to give your patient the best possible chance, regardless of what you see on your imaging studies. And let's look at um, a perfusion CT study and a patient with a distal basilar artery occlusion. What do we see according to the rapid analysis in which uh, the ischemic core is defined by an, a relative CBF lower than 30%. There's a very small core of three milliliters located at the pons. And then there's a quite large uh, penumbra, I'd say, and a high mismatch ratio. But is this accurate? Well, let's look at the unenhanced CT of this patient. We clearly see that the patient already has an established infarction in at least the territory of the left superior cerebellar artery. And this was not picked up on our perfusion CT. And why is that? That's because the thresholds uh, for your ischemic core, your RCBF lower than 30%, is basically validated for anterior circulation strokes, but not for posterior circulation strokes. So you can't really use these thresholds, these cutoffs for detecting, uh, for um, describing the size of the ischemic core or the size of the penumbra. They are quite useless in that regard. And keep that in mind when you analyze these perfusion CT reconstructions. Now let's talk a bit about CT angiography. The role of CT angiography is primarily to detect the size of a large vessel occlusion. And let's magnify the CT angiography studies and this uh, patient over here. We see that there is a complete occlusion of the distal part of the basilar artery. And it's very difficult to miss an occlusion this size. The basilar artery can be occluded uh, in its entirety or can be 
look, uh, occluded more focally. Uh, generally, when you have occlusions of the proximal part of the basilar artery, these tend to be atherosclerotic occlusions. The same applies to occlusions of the middle part of the basilar artery, while proximal basilar artery occlusions, no, I'm sorry, distal basilar artery occlusions tend to have a cardioembolic origin, and cardioembolic origin will be more frequent and an occlusion located over here. This is another illustration. This patient had a very dense left vertebral artery and a uh, uh, this should be proximal, not distal, uh, basilar artery on an enhanced CT of the brain. The distal basilar artery has a normal density. It's very subject subjective uh, describing or evaluating the density of an artery on an enhanced CT of the brain. But when you look at the density over here and the distal part and the density over here, well, there's a clear difference over there. And that should make us suspect a thrombus or an occlusion. And these are some magnified images and they more clearly show you the difference in uh, density between these various parts of uh, the posterior circulation arteries I just described. And on the CT angiography, which we should perform to confirm the presence of an occlusion, we see that the distal part of the basilar artery is clearly open. We see here the posterior cerebral arteries and the superior cerebral arteries, but we also see that uh, the proximal part and the middle part of the basilar artery are occluded and the occlusion is very sharp. It's very abrupt, which makes me suspect that this is probably not going to be an atherosclerotic occlusion, but a cardioembolic occlusion, but you can't be 100% sure. What do we see on the uh, rest of the CT angiographic study? Uh, this is the left, the left subclavian artery, and we see that there is a soft plaque in the left subclavian artery. And this soft plaque, if you look at these coronal reconstructions, is quite extensive and it extends all the way to the origin of the left vertebral artery. If we go back to axial images, this is the origin or the proximal part, the V1 part of the left vertebral artery. And this is the left subclavian over here, which is now free of uh, thrombus. We see that this is a free floating, unstable plaque, and probably part of it has flown into the basilar artery and caused an acute occlusion. And this also illustrates another important role for CT angiography, not just in posterior circulation stroke, but also in anterior circulation stroke, detecting the cause of the occlusion. I always tell my residents, it's not just about detecting an occlusion. You have done half your work if you detect an occlusion, but the second part is wondering why did this occlude it? all of a sudden, what could be the possible cause or the possible origin? And here it's an unstable plaque located in the left subclavian artery extending into the origin of the left vertebral artery. This is a trauma patient who had a posterior circulation stroke. I'm not showing you the an enhanced CT images. We are just going to focus on the CT angiography in this patient. This is the anatomy illustrated once again. We have the pre-foraminal segment, the foraminal segment, we have the V3 segment and the V4 segment. Let's magnify the V3 segment because that looks a little bit abnormal. It's very irregular if you look carefully. And we also have here something located centrally within the vertebral artery. What could this be? Keep in mind, this is a trauma patient. Patient suffered a uh, vehicle accident. And if you look at the axial reconstructions, we see that the vertebral artery, this is the V3 segment, uh, looks very thin and irregular. And there is also, should come now, there is also thickening of the wall of the vertebral artery due to the presence of a so-called mural hematoma. And this is a clear dissection of the left vertebral artery. Uh, this is another case of a left vertebral artery dissection in which we see a very focal dissection flap extending into the lumen of the vertebral artery and this is also going to be the V3 level of the vertebral artery. 
This is a patient who had a complete occlusion of the basilar artery, and we also see no opacification uh, with contrast of the V4 segments of the vertebral artery, and the source in this patient was a thrombus located in the left ventricle of the heart in a patient with a chronic, uh, I believe it was a genetic, but I'm not sure, cardiomyopathy. Uh, I always include part of the heart on a CT angiography study. Uh, there are studies who have shown that the usefulness for detecting the cardiac source of a possible embolus is not that high, but I always think, what have you got to lose by doing it? Very little, you give a little bit more radiation to your patient, but your patient is suffering from a stroke, uh, has a diagnosis with a severe morbidity and mortality, so I believe it is warranted in cases like these, and you can sometimes pick up the cause of a large vessel occlusion. So let's summarize the role of CT and posterior circulation stroke. You start with an enhanced CT and the role is the same as for anterior circulation stroke. You want to rule out hemorrhage and other causes of the symptoms of the patient and you try to scrutinize the images for signs of early infarction, uh, a possible dense artery sign, but these findings uh, are not always present, despite the fact that there can be an infarction uh, or an occlusion. So the sensitivity of an enhanced CT of the brain is low for the diagnosis of an acute posterior circulation stroke. By adding perfusion CT, you will clearly improve improve your diagnostic accuracy, your chances of missing a stroke will decrease substantially, but keep in mind that there are no validated thresholds uh, for uh, defining what is an ischemic core and a penumbra and a large vessel occlusion in the posterior circulation. So you can't really use it as a treatment decision tool, but it definitely has an important role as a diagnostic tool. So I advocate doing it, but that's personal, but I have um, uh, strong arguments based on the medical literature to do it. And lastly, CT angiography is basically the same as for anterior circulation strokes. You want to detect a large vessel occlusion and you also want to uh, scrutinize the images for the possible causes of the occlusion uh, by looking at the heart, by ruling out a dissection and so on. And by combining these three uh, your unenhanced CT of the brain, your perfusion CT of the brain, and your CT angiography of the brain, you will reach a very high diagnostic accuracy, and that's what you want in the end. So my advice is, if a patient is suspected of having a posterior circulation stroke, just do the same uh, imaging-wise as you would do for an anterior circulation stroke. Do an unenhanced CT, a CT, perf a CT perfusion, and a CT angiography. Let's now talk about the role of MRI and posterior circulation stroke. It can be done in the acute phase. In our center, it's often uh, done in the second phase uh, for the assessment of the final infarction, the size of the final infarction, the final damage, and also for the detection of lacrimal stroke, which can easily detect um, easily escape detection even when you do an enhanced CT, CT perfusion and CT angiography. Uh, these are the patterns you can see on MRI studies when it comes to posterior circulation strokes. Patients can have territorial infarctions caused by occlusion of a large vessel, like in this patient, uh, this patient has a posterior cerebral artery stroke involving the entire territory of the posterior cerebral artery, also the medial and uh, the medial and inferior part of the temporal lobe. And these patients over here have a lacunar infarction caused by occlusions of perforating branches uh, of, uh, in this case, the basal artery, and in this case, this is going to be a perforating branch of the posterior cerebral artery to the thalamus. And this is just a depiction of the uh, vascular, um, the vascular patterns you can see in the several uh, vascular territories of posterior circulation. This is the territory of the posterior cerebral artery, which also involves, as said, the inferior and medial part of the temporal lobe. So it often involves the parahypocampal region and the hypocampus, as was the case in this patient. This is an infarction located 
on the territory of the superior cerebellar artery. And notice here on the cervical reconstruction that it is the superior half of the cerebellar artery that is infarcted. That can sometimes be a bit more difficult to evaluate on the actual slices, but you can do your cervical slices for additional confirmation. And when it comes to the territory of the anterior, inferior, and the posterior, inferior cerebellar arteries, uh, the anterior and inferior cerebral artery is generally located more laterally, and the posterior and inferior cerebral artery is generally located more medially uh, along the inferior surface of the cerebral hemisphere. And in your posterior and inferior cerebral arteries, you, uh, artery strokes, you can sometimes have involvement of the lateral posterior part of the medulla oblongata, and when that is involved, patients will clinically present with a so-called Wallenberg syndrome, something our neurology colleague, colleagues know better than I do as a simple neuroradiologist. This is a patient with a very extensive infarction involving the inferior part of the cerebellar hemisphere. And notice that most of the medial part, but also the lateral part of the inferior cerebellar surface is involved in this patient. And as such, you have a lot of variability in the vascular supply of the inferior surface of the cerebellum. This is going to be a dominant posterior inferior cerebellar artery in a patient with presumably a hypoplastic ipsilateral anterior inferior cerebellar artery. So the size of these infarctions can vary considerably depending on the variation of the vascular supply. This is a patient with a proximal, my apologies, a distal basilar artery occlusion extending into the T1 segment of the posterior cerebellar arteries bilaterally. We also don't see the superior cerebellar arteries, which have to be occluded as well, or are definitely not supplied with blood. And this is the stroke pattern as we observed it on MRI. We see that the territory, so this is a so-called top of the basilar artery pattern. Once again, uh, what you see may depend a bit on the size of the occlusion. Uh, sometimes it can be limited to infarctions in the midbrain and the thalamus, but over here it's quite extensive with involvement of the superior cerebral artery territory on both sides. There's also an infarction uh, in the left half of the pump, so there must be an occlusion of a perforating branch of the basilar artery as well. We see over here infarctions in the territory of the central midbrain and the bilateral thalamus, which are supplied by perforation, so-called thalamoperforating branches, uh, and this bilaterally. And we also have infarctions in the occipital lobes on both sides, also involving the hippocampus on both sides, due to occlusions of the posterior cerebral arteries. This is another patient with an occlusion of the middle and the distal part of the basilar artery, more clearly seen as we magnify it a little bit. And in this patient, we saw a very extensive infarction centrally in the pons because the perforating branches, most of the perforating branches to the pons are occluded. Uh, this is a patient, or yeah, this is a patient with a very small Lechner stroke. So we are now moving from a large vessel occlusion to isolated perforating branch occlusions. When an isolated perforating branch is occluded, patients generally get a very small Lechner infarction, and the clinic presentation will depend on the location of the infarction. And this patient, the presentation was an intranuclear ophthalmoplegia, so the infarction involves some of the oculomotor pathways, posteriorly in the brainstem, and we have a punctate focus of diffusion restriction, which is located somewhere along the course of the medial longitudinal fasciculus, which connects the abducens nerve with the oculomotor nerve, as you know. Here we have a very, here we have a patient with a vertigo, very unspecific clinical symptoms. So, or um, let's say we didn't really suspect to find something in this in this patient. We get a lot of MRIs for vertigo and most are negative. So this patient had a very small lesion, as you can see on the fusion-related images. Uh, you can ask yourself if it's an artifact, maybe. 
So we did a so-called zoomit diffusion-weighted image, which is basically a diffusion-weighted image with a very small field of view, which can sometimes more accurately, accurately depict very small lacunar infarctions. And we believe that this was a very small lacunar brainstem infarction, probably involving one of the vestibular nuclei causing the acute vertigo in this patient. So it's possible that these sometimes very small infarctions are overlooked or not depicted, depicted rather on diffusion rated images in patients with uh, vertigo. This is, well, should we call this a lacunar stroke or not? I believe technically we do because this infarction pattern is also caused by occlusion of a perforating artery in this patient by an occlusion of a so-called ramus at pontem, a perforating branch of the basal artery supplying uh, a local half of the pons. We see that the infarction is black on the AVC map, so it's through diffusion restriction and it's hyper intense on the two rated images. And on the CT, we could even de uh, detect it as well. We see it over here, but retrospectively, uh, normally you have a lot of artifacts in the brainstem, or you often have a lot of artifacts in the brainstem on an enhanced CT. So it's not easy to detect these kind of infarctions on an enhanced CT. Sometimes you can, and of course, it's always easier if you detect them later on when you have already performed the MRI. Uh, that's typically when you have uh, a conference with your uh, neurology colleagues. You know, yeah, when you look back at it, you could already see it. Well, looking back is always easy. Everything is more clear and easy, easier when you look back. So we have basically two kinds of lacunar strokes involving the brainstem. We can have these very small lacunar infarctions uh, caused by proximal occlusions of a perforating branch of the basilar artery. And this is generally caused by uh, atherosclerosis. We have atherosclerosis and the basilar artery extending into one or more of the perforating branches to the brainstem. And these infarctions will be quite large, will uh, involve half of the territory, one half of the territory of the pump, um, and will generally reach all the way onto the anterior surface because the occlusion is generally located at the orifice of the perforating branch. And in contrast, we sometimes have these very small lacunar infarctions which do not reach all the way to the anterior surface. And these are generally caused by small vessel disease. So not by a large vessel atherosclerosis, but by so-called uh, lipohyalinotic disease, uh, isolated small vessel disease. So then we get so-called island deep infarctions and the clinical presentation will depend on where it is located. This is a very small lateral infarction involving the lateral part of the thalamus. And infarctions over here can clinically be isolated with the lateral stroke syndrome of uh, contralateral hemi hypesthesia, so sensory deficits in the contralateral part of the body. And sometimes, if you have that in your clinical request form, the patient has, for instance, uh, left sided. Uh, sensory deficits uh, definitely scrutinize the lateral part of the contralateral thalamus because you could pick it up on your unenhanced CT of the brain, especially if you window it, if you window it a little bit more strongly. So there we have our uh, lacunar infarction, and this is another patient with a similar lacunar infarction and the uh, other this time the left uh, thalamus. And in the second patient, the first patient, CT angiography was negative. In this patient, however, there is a very focal occlusion located at the transition of the P1 segment to the P2 segment of the left posterior cerebral artery. And this is the place where the lateral, where the perforating branches originate, supplying the lateral half of the thalamus. So uh, we have perforating branches originating from the P1 segment, which will uh, supply the medial thalamus and the central midbrain. And, but we also have perforating branches originating from the P2 segment, and these will supply the lateral part of the thalamus. Once again, the vascular supply of the thalamus is a bit more complicated like this, but this makes it easy to understand and suffices 
for uh, the sake of this presentation. And this is basically the same patient once again, which yields a very focal occlusion. And this was the patient with the final diagnosis of a primary angiitis of the central nervous system, but with isolated involvement of the, of the less posterior cerebral artery. This is another infarction type. So here we have infarction in the medial thalamus bilaterally extending into the central midbrain. This is an infarction pattern that can be seen in very small top of the basilar artery occlusions in which only the thalamoperforating branches are occluded, but if you see nothing between, nothing at all in the top of the basilar artery, then it's probably a so-called perforan infarction, an infarction of the artery of perforan. And what is that? Now, the clinical presentation can be quite variable because there is involvement of the medial part of the thalamus bilaterally. These patients will often have somnolence uh, or coma, um, depending on the extensiveness of the infarction, making them difficult to evaluate clinically. And, and the involvement of part of the midbrain can cause oculomotor deficits. But once again, clinical presentation can be nonspecific. On these images, we see that there is nothing wrong with the basilar artery, is not occluded at all. We don't see thalamoperforating branches, but these are difficult to detect on an MRI angiography. So let's not draw any conclusions based on that. Based on the pattern of the infarction and the fact that we didn't see an abnormality in the top of the basilar artery, we concluded that this was an infarction due to an occlusion of the artery of Percheron. And what is that? Well, it's an uh, anatomical variant. In a normal situation, you have several small perforating branches originating from the top of the basilar and the P1 segment of the cerebral artery, supplying the medial part of the thalamus and the central midbrain. And an artery of Percheron, uh, you have basically basically a one branch, uh, generally originating from the P1 segment of the posterior cerebral artery, sometimes from the top of the basilar, supplying these structures. Uh, and uh, this is an illustration I picked from Osborne's brain, credit where credit is due, but I asked for permission from Anne Osborne directly. So this is me. No, this is Anne Osborne. Let's not confuse us. I look totally different. She looks a lot younger than I do. Uh, this is also an old picture. So this is Anne Osborne, very nice person, by the way, and also a real authority in radiology. So I was really thrilled when I was able to take this selfie with Anne Osborne and uh, when I had the chance to meet her personally. Uh, this is once again a pattern that looks like an artery of Percheron infarction with infarctions involving the medial part of the thalamus on both sides and the central midbrain. And in this patient, this patient had atherosclerosis quite clearly. There's some irregularity of the basilar artery and also of the P1 segment of the cerebral artery on the right side. And we see a total occlusion of the P1 segment. So the theory here is that the artery of Percheron probably originated from the left posterior cerebral artery, which is occluded in this patient. So we probably have to uh, turn this image around and make the artery of Percheron or originate from this cerebral artery uh, to make it correct. Uh, this is the same, or is it a different patient? I'm not really sure. I think it's the same patient. So we have our uh, infarction involving the medial part of the thalamus on both sides. And look, we even had a dense vessel sign located in the P1 segment of the posterior cerebral artery. And these are the CT angiography studies showing us the occlusion. Uh, and these are several kinds of uh, variations you can have. And this type over here, uh, the medial thalamus is supplied by separate perforating branches. And this type over here, you have several branches, but originating all from the P1 segment of, in this case, the right cerebral, posterior cerebral artery. Here we have one branch of which all the several uh, perforating branches arise. And here we have a type 3, a so-called connecting arc. I believe this variability, well, we cannot de depict this on CT angiography, we cannot see it on MR angiography. It's just something to keep in mind that even when it comes to the RT of Percheron, there's a lot of variability over there, which can cause some variability 
and what you see on your MRI studies when it comes to the final stroke pattern. So this is what we assume occurs in this patient, either this situation or this situation, I'd say. One of uh, these as possible. And finally, in a lot of older patients, you will often see so-called silent cerebral infarctions. These are very frequent in the elderly, and we pick them up on a daily basis. Uh, very often, there is no clinical history of ischemic stroke, so they are silent infarctions, and they are so-called MRT infarctions. My uh, residents often describe them as old lacunar infarctions, but these are not caused by occlusions of perforating branches. These are basically caused by and arterial infarctions, and I'm going to show you an illustration later uh, to show you where the, these are located. And they are generally found in the posterior and inferior surface of the cerebellum involving the cortex, and they tend to be wedge-shaped or linear. And uh, this is probably one of those infarctions in the acute phase. Uh, I believe this was an incidental finding. The patient was not suspected of having a stroke, was an elderly patient. We have diffusion restrictive lesion, it's linear, involving the posterior and inferior cortical surface of the right cerebellar hemisphere, hyperintense on flare. And this is a study done by a good friend of mine, Lawrence de Cocker, Belgian neuroradiologist, who did uh, a lot of, he has published a lot and did his PhD on um, cerebellar uh, strokes, and uh, who basically described uh, what probably is the cause of these very small uh, distal infarctions. It's an occlusion of these uh, very small end arterial branches supplying the cerebellar cortex, which explains why they often look linear and are often located in the cortex of the cerebellar surface. So that concludes my presentation on imaging of posterior circulation strokes. Some key messages. Uh, well, this is maybe a bit arrogant. I should have uh, suggested it otherwise, but to think of posterior circulation stroke in a clinician doesn't. Well, uh, let's not pretend we know it better than our uh, clinician colleagues. But as a radiologist, it can be important to realize that just performing an unenhanced CT of a brain to rule out an ischemic stroke and the posterior circulation is not sufficient. And that's maybe something our neurology colleagues know, but an uh, emergency room physician who has to know a lot of stuff about a lot of things is not always aware of. So it can be important to point that out when somebody with vertigo, nausea, and so on receives an unenhanced CT of the brain to rule out stroke, communicate with your physician that an enhanced CT has a very low sensitivity for the detection of acute posterior circulation strokes. And if he really wants to rule it out and really has a high clinical suspicion, the examination should be enhanced with perfusion CT and CT angiography preferentially. A dense vascular artery, it's nice when we see it, but it has a very low sensitivity, so it never obviates the need for CT angiography. CT perfusion is very useful for increasing your detection rate, but has no role in uh, detecting or defining what the ischemic core or the penumbra is. When you do CT angiography, it's more than just looking for where is the occlusion located, also use it as a tool to detect the possible cause of the stroke, like for instance, a dissection. And when it comes to MRI, the, the role of MRI is mainly assessing the final damage and detecting small lacunar strokes who can detect uh, escape detection on CT studies, even if you do everything unenhanced CT, CT perfusion, and CT angiography. Uh, okay, these are a lot of colleagues I would like to thank. Uh, these are the neurovascular teams of the University Hospital of Ghent and the University Hospital of Antwerp, which, uh, with whom I work together regularly. Special thanks to a lot of specially trained LAMAs who also played a role in uh, helping me make this presentation. And thank you all for watching. Thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, comments, or feedback, you can send me an email at neuroradiology.online at gmail.com or you can use a comment in the comment section. Thank you very much.